very much for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure and honor to share with you our experience in, with neuroanabolics and the uh, functional rehabilitation of patients. And I have no disclosures. And ladies and gentlemen, we are in the fourth phase of the industrial revolution, and that includes AI, nano and biotechnology, 3D printings, and robotics. And the field of robotics is uh, evolving dramatically. And uh, this gentleman wasn't actually the, the first to build an Iron Man or an exoskeleton. Actually, were well, those gentlemen from General Electric back in 65. They built in an Army-Navy collaboration the first exoskeleton in order to amplify human strength by a factor of 25. So, it took, but it took 50 more years to uh, develop the technology so we can use this exoskeleton. And this newspaper article is already five years old, showing several uh, different exoskeletons for several different applications. And amongst others, the Hull exoskeleton in the middle on the bottom, which was used um, during the Fukushima catastrophe, where you can still find those mutated daisies you see on the top right side. And um, this hull exoskeleton is unique and different from the others because the others are passive exoskeletons, so the patient has to change balance to lean forward in order to initiate motion. And this exoskeleton is used in EMG-based neuromuscular feedback system. So we had this great Japanese innovation, and they tested it for several different applications, but there was no systematic approach. So there was a missing piece, and there was, at that time, German methodology. So my, the boss from my home hospital back in Germany, he saw that, and he took this device and brought it to Germany in order to test it in the rehabilitation in spinal cord injuries. So he wanted to figure out, is it feasible? What are appropriate indications? And what kind of functional and neurological improvement can we expect from those rehabilitations? And about five years later, 10 studies later, and 120 patients later, we know it is feasible, it is effective, and it's safe in patients with spinal cord injuries. They could in increase the endurance and the pace even without the exoskeletons. They could um, improve their whiskey 2 score and no major adverse events were recorded. So we know it is beneficial for patients with spinal cord injuries. What we didn't know was does it maybe have an effect on patients with neurologic disorders as well. So we wanted to analyze can we expect the uh, changes in the functional mobility? Can we uh, expect changes in life quality or bladder function? So we set up this prospective interventional pilot studies, a study with six patients, everyone with a unique authority and all of those patients underwent 60 sessions of a body weight supported treadmill training in the hull suit over a course of 12 weeks. We took several mobility measurements and measured the life quality and the bladder function. Our primary follow-up was six months, and those are our results. So we can see that all patients improved the distance uh, they covered on a trip, uh, uh, over six minutes in a six-minute walk distance. Uh, all patients decreased the time that was needed for the time up and go test, and all patients increased the total distance covered on a treadmill during their training session. And five out of six patients improved their back balance scale, and five out of six patients improved their whiskey score. And um, in order to show what that means, here are like two short videos. This is one of our patient at baseline. So like before the training session started, you see like very unstable, very slow gait. And this, this is how it looks like after 12 weeks of training. So way more fluent, definitely faster. And uh, this is true for the tuck test as well. So the tuck test measures the time um, the patient needs to stand up from a chair and walk three meters. And you see here, like before the training session, very slow, it's hard to get up from the chair, very unstable and uh, unfluent walk. And this is how it looks like after 12 weeks. So it's by far easier for the patient to get up from the chair. She's walking faster, more fluent, more stable. So please don't look at the numbers in that table. We set up this table in order to illustrate our results. And basically, 
um, it's color coded, it's green means it's improvement, blue means the result was stable, and red means it got worse. And what we can see when we look, all those measurements in the red frame are mobility measurements. So we can see like nearly every patient improved in every mobility score. But guess what? Measuring life quality using the EQ5D, one patient got better, one got even worse. So, and when we look at the bladder function results, they were inconsistent. So, and that was pretty surprising for us. And when we take, for instance, our first patient, 32-year-old female patient, she wasn't even able to perform the tuck test or to perform the six-minute walk test. And she improved in every mobility score, but her life quality got worse. So that was surprising for us when we talked with the PTs, we talked with the patient, and she said she just had higher expectations. So difficult to put that into uh, good context. And when we look in the literature, we already talked about um, the spinal cord injury patient, but for instance, when we look for stroke patients, there are seven, eight studies about the hull in stroke patients. The problem is um, they all use different patients acute, superacute versus chronic. They use different exoskeleton types, single leg versus double leg. They have a different uh, training schedule, like time on the treadmill, the course of training. So the data are very inconsistent. It's like hard to compare those patients. So that's why I put here a question mark. And when we look, for instance, for a, a HAL rehabilitation in patients with multiple sclerosis, there's nothing out there. There are two studies about passive exoskeleton in MS patients, and one says, concludes, it may approve accuracy, walking, and posture in MS patients. And there's one clinical trial, randomized controlled, 52 patients, but they did only two sessions a week over six weeks, but they could even show that walking endurance and the balance uh, significantly improved um, compared to conventional walk therapy. What is definitely missing, we don't have any study out there comparing different exoskeleton devices. So we still don't know if we compare when we talk about those exoskeletons, apples to oranges, or if we end up and say, okay, all of them are equally beneficial for the patients. And when it comes to HAL, it seems like we have uh, three different groups of patients. We have the spinal cord injury patients, we have stroke vascular, vascular patients with a central problem, and we have prob uh, patients with a neurological disorder. So, and we know from the experience back in Germany, like when it comes to HAL, and the rehabilitation of spinal cord injury patients, we are basically good to go. It's safe, it's feasible, it's effective, so why waiting anymore? The data for the stroke patients are very inconsistent, that's why I put here a question mark, and we definitely need more research in, uh, for patients with neurological disorder. So in conclusion, it is feasible, it is in fact effective. All patients improve their functional mobility. Uh, we couldn't show an impact on uh, the life quality or bladder function yet. Sure, we have several limitations. It's a small and heterogeneous group. We just have a limited follow-up. We didn't have a control group of conventional uh, PT, and we only have little, little evidence in the literature. But still, it feels like we did our first step research-wise. We literally helped the patients to, their, to do their first steps. And those are our next steps. We further analyze the upcoming patients. We definitely want to put together an S group, and we want to analyze life quality, bladder function, and medication in a bigger picture with more patients and a longer follow-up. We have a total goal of 30 patients, and like when we talk about neurobotics in general, it might be used in more patients more frequently and early in the rehabilitation to uh, achieve a functional preservation, ultimately leading to a patient-tailored rehabilitation. And this is one of our MS patients, one of our PTs. Just want to use this opportunity to thank the PTs because they are the real stars. It takes like 30 to 45 minutes at the beginning to put the patient in this suit and to set everything up. It's a lot of work, a lot of dedication. So without their help, it wouldn't, those results wouldn't be possible. Thank you very much.